Okay, just uh, a quick review of, uh, of the concept uh, in, the, in, the, in the project of the Ateneos, okay. Uh, Ateneos de Fabricació of Barcelona, it's a project based on the idea. Ah, okay. So Ateneos de, Ateneos de Fabricació uh, uh, from Barcelona, it's a project uh, based on the idea to uh, share all the new technologies, uh, the new digital technologies from the 3D printing to uh, laser cutting and help all the entrepreneurs and people that want to learn how to, how to manage all this new technology uh, in every way. Okay, so today we have uh, four of our most powerful projects in our way to, to, to learn and, and apply the technologies. So, <laughs> welcome and enjoy. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Beatriz Guedan and I am a product designer. I recently graduated from Elisaba Design and Engineering School of Barcelona. And I will be presenting my final degree project called Inter, a textile architecture. So the initial subject matter of this project was the maker movement. The aim of this movement is to create new relationships questioning the pre-established roles of the designers, the consumers, and the manufacturers in order to pr promote local and collaborative processes to reindustrialize the urban area and to create new sustainable economies. So the, they do, the maker movement does this by creating new interactions between society and technology in order to empower the people. So as a maker, um, we should, when we start a project, we should take into consideration the three aspects of this triangle. In my case, when I started my thesis, I had no idea what product I wanted to design or what technology I wanted to use. But I had a clear interest in textiles. So I started to investigate um, different aspects related to textiles, including fashion and textile industry, textile techniques, synthetic textiles, and I also combined this investigation with a parallel one not so um, related to textiles, um, such as architectural systems and plastics. In, um, in, in specific, I was very interested in bubble wrap, as you will see. So finally, I, I, my proposal was to design a digitally fabricated constructive solution that would follow the inner structure of bubble wrap in order to apply this plastic into the design of a bag. So as you can see, my proposal combined many different um, fields. On one end, we have more of the textile uh, 2D micro scale um, world. On the other hand, we have more of the ar architectural systems, and I also combined inspiration from the fashion industry and uh, packaging and constructive materials as I was using bubble wrap. So I had clear now what product I wanted to design and what technology I wanted to use. Now I had to know how I was going to do it and where I was going to do it. So the first step of the process was to find the pattern that would best fit the gap between the bubbles. And then I would have to design the components that would build the bag following this pattern. Then I would have to figure out how these components would assemble to finally obtain my, my architecture and my product. So where? Um, I was very determined to find a place where I could um, really spend my time with this 3D printing technology and um, get to know how this technology, wor technology works and how the machines work because I had never previously used the, this technology. So I went to Ateneo de Fabricación de las Cortes because um, it is an open, uh, an open space where they have technology and um, 
and a space open for anyone to develop their projects. And so I went there and at first, the first few weeks, they just taught me around how, how the space works and how the technology works. And after that, I was able to go there whenever I could, develop my project, and really just get to know how the machine works without having supervision 24-7. So for me, it was the perfect opportunity um, to properly develop this thesis. So when I started to develop the 3D structure, I, excuse me, the image, um, I started to um, design more 3D architectural systems. And obviously, when I realized how this machine works, um, I, I was aware that I couldn't 3D print this. And so I started with, excuse me. OK, I am back. <laughs> Um, so, when I realized that those structures weren't, I wasn't able to print them, um, I started to print uh, patterns that were much simpler, starting from hexagons, circles, and at this point I started to print with um, a hard material, and then I realized I, I needed to print in a flexible material. So this whole process was very progressive and me just experimenting with the machine and seeing what works better or worse. Here, for example, um, I started to print very thin textiles and really taking the machine to, to its limits and seeing what, how thin I could print. Again, more trials of seeing how uh, the thickness, um, how the machine would work with which parameters. And so, as you can see, I, I did a lot of trials um, and just trying to decide what would work best for the design of the bag until I finally um, obtained my product. So, Inter is a very um, light and medium-sized bag. It has a very industrial aspect. And as you can see, the um, architectural system that I applied on my bag is mostly uh, focused on the in the center area of of the product. But as the go since the goal of this project is to open it for everyone, um, because it is an open source file, um, anyone could take my file and adapt the the architecture to their needs and their and their um, necessities. So if they wanted to um, to make the structure cover the entire bag, they could. They could also change the size of the bag. So it's really up to anyone. This is just my take on my project, but it can be adapted to any use. Um, also, in my case, I decided to include two different handles of two different materials and two different um, sizes. But again, anyone could reuse whatever handle they want and incorporate it. I also designed a version in white. And so, as you can see in the um, um, in the open layout. This is how every component should be placed on the bubble wrap before um, folding everything and assembling it with small screws. And so I ended up designing si six uh, different components. In total, there were 11 units. And so as you can see, um, at first glance, the, the central section seems like it's only one component but it's actually built up by six components. So the fact that all of these are joined together, it allows um, the bag to be more resistant and handle more weight. So um, now I'll show quickly all of the different components. Um, so every component follows the same pattern, as you will see, but each of them differ in size and in thickness because it depends on the function and the, and the and where they are found in the bag. So for example, this is the central body of the bag. Um, the cent Wait, one second. So um, what I just said was this, this central part of the bag. Um, this is the central body, so it is a um, it continues the central body, it folds to the bottom, and then it folds, sorry, it folds back to the other side. So as you can see, the thickness at the bottom is, um, is increases because it has to sustain more weight at the bottom, and it also, it also has to protect the, bottles, the bu bubbles at the bottom. So as you can see, the thickness varies there. 
then the additional base, which is the prolongation of the central base, and there are two pieces on each side. Then the handles consist on the prolongation of the central base, and then it folds on the inside, as you can see, and it screws from one side to another. So um, the, in this longitudinal um, line is left at the top so that you can fold, fold the handles through. So at first glance, again, it seems like it's one piece, but in reality, there's a few components because I had to adapt with the dimensions of the machine that I had. Um, and then finally, the small, um, the small pieces. This is the small side that acts as one of the hems of the bag. The top edge, which is inside. So it's all um, finished as if it was a proper bag so that there's no pieces of plastic flying around. And yeah. And so basically, um, this, this is by, by showing all of you this project, um, I'm showing just an example of how um, we should design alternatives to um, li linear economies and to very unsustainable processes. So um, in the case of this product, the life cycle of it is completely circular. So we start with fabricating, uh, digitally fabricating the structure and applying it to a plastic that would usually be thrown away after its first use. And so we're prolonging the life of the plastic, giving it a new life. And so once this bubble wrap is, um, is discarded and the air bubble and the air is gone, we can deassemble de the, the textile architecture. Um, we can recycle the plastic and reuse the, the textile architecture again. So the circle is always, um, is always closed in a way that we are using one textile architecture for as many bags as we want. And so to finish off, I wanted to quickly state um, the principles that define this project. Um, the project is defined by 11 principles that follow the concepts of uh, the maker movement and of circular economies. And in general, it just shows um, all of the aspects that we should take in consideration when, um, when designing and proposing new projects locally in our cities. Thank you. Ha pasado el mateix problema que l'altre dia. Tenen que fer un... Però abans el tenies connectat aquí, no? No, no, era aquí. Tenies el propell, no? El d'aquí era ella. No, no, és que és el mateix problema. És que no em detecta ni altre. Vale. Espera, no, espera, si puedes copiar los dos. Sí, jo veig una cosa. Però qual té, abro? Abre'm el portes PowerPoint. Estan a fer això? No, el portes PowerPoint. A ver, si estoy mejorando en el PowerPoint, en el PDF está como... Vale, pues si quieres, cambiamos. Lo siento.
Uh, good afternoon. I'm David Mesa, uh, co-founder of DMS Architecture and also visual artist. Um, when I was a kid, I spent, experienced something so powerful, I spent the rest of my life searching for it. What I experienced wasn't virtual reality, but the first video games, and this is where the story begins. That's me when I was five in front of my first computer. And look on my clothes. The, cost, the costume made of plas a plastic sword and a kerchief around my neck was the prelude of what I have been searching since then. The interaction between the body and what was happening in front of my eyes. Being part of the history through an immersive experience. The game started to open the mind to new worlds of possibility. So, the game allow fictional adventures to have a higher emotional resonance. Some of you will recognize that game called The Secret of Monkey Island. In that game, one could feel part of a history. It was not based in fighting against monsters, but to explore and interact with a world. You were not just a passive reader of Treasure Island by Stevenson. The possibility to explore a fictional reality, even though it was made only a couple of big pixels, pixels made one feel as part of it, involved with it through making decisions, speaking and using objects and talking with other characters. So some years le later appeared The Sims, maybe some of you also uh, have played with this. This game represented a new uh, level of experience because you were not just uh, allowed to interact with other characters, but also you were able to create your own world. So there were more possibilities of creation. There was also the possibility of creating your own character, and this character could be also yourself. So you, uh, games were starting to involve uh, the player in a higher, in a higher possibilities. And nowadays, uh, recently appeared uh, Minecraft, which is in first person, so the character is yourself, you don't have to customize it, and you can create your own world by interacting with all these cubicle pieces you can see there. So, some years later I started architecture, and this is a project of my first year, and I was trying to develop uh, a space with what I had in mind from that previous experiences with games. So you can see it, it started to appear like la uh, liner drawings, but there were also 3D modeling right there made with AutoCAD. So after that, uh, I started to ad adopt the representation of architecture, the traditional one, through the years of my career. So this is a common plan almost of you have seen uh, signaling the emergency exit, for example. Uh, also exploring representation of space through uh, models, physical models, that you could then take photographs and represent your project. And finally, also with rendering, you could uh, recreate three-dimensional spaces with textures and lights like this. But all these experiences ha had a problem, and it is that there are just images. For this, you have to wait two hours to get that image from a 3D model. So it's not as fast and, and visual than with video games. So when I arrived to my final year in architecture, I, des I decided to use a new technology that recently came up to the market that it was virtual reality. And I developed my project with an HTC Vive system based on two sensors that uh, allow you to go through the space, uh, cap uh, capturing your movements and allowing you to, to interact with the space. So it's an improved uh, uh, experience of, what, of the video games we, said we have seen before. And for the, the recreation of the space, I used Unreal Engine, which is a software for making video games. So I was introducing in a world that I previously knew, but I forgot during my years of student. And this uh, implied me to develop a research uh, 
uh, it was also funded by the Ministry of Education of Spain, so it, I, it was possible to to research more, more deeply in that technology because uh, some money is always useful for that kind of stuff. <laughs> so what was the project, the project about? Uh, during my years of student in the architecture degree, I had the opportunity to collaborate with a research group as an assistant teacher in theory and history of architecture subjects. So I did some experiments with, uh, with the students based on the group Olipo, which was a French group of literates from the 60s. And Raymond Queneau and Georges Perec were part of it. And then we were trying to establish uh, limitations by establishing rules in order to obtain more, more, more freedom in the process of creation. So these are some of the exercises that appeared in that classes. And the, de the debate was if this was or wasn't architecture. So all the subject was focused on that question. What is architecture? So uh, this was the result of investigations and the start of my final degree project. I started with my limitation, which was an, a, hypercube, a, a hyper, hypercube, which is a four-dimensional mathematical structure. And now we will see how it works. Here you have a square made of four points. And then the intersection of that points are lines. This is uh, clear. I, I hope. Then, if we do the same exercise with a cube, the same points that uh, delimited the square now are intersected in planes instead of lines. And finally, in the hypercube, the intersection between points are cubes. Uh, clear, right? So, we will see where are those cubes and how they work. Here you can see those cubes uh, take apart one from another, and as you can see, they are uh, they are not uh, represented as this one, but they are distorted. So uh, why are distorted? Are they distorted? Because we are seeing a shadow of a shadow, and now we will see what a shadow of a shadow means. Here we have what in ma mathematics is called a conformal projection. That is a projection which of a figure which angles are not distorted. So this is 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees. Then with a cube, this is not a conformal projecto projection because some of the angles are distorted, but we can have a conformal projection with uh, a 3D model like this one. But in a hypercube, a 3D model is a shadow of a four dimension. We are one di dimension higher. So a 3D, object, a 3D representation of a hypercube is a shadow. And this is the shadow of the 3D shadow of the hypercube. That is why I said we were looking at a shadow of a shadow when I showed you the eight cubes. So there you have the development of different representations of the hypercube. They are uh, also shadows, and one which is really clear is the cross with uh, four branches that you can see in the bottom of the, of the image. So this was the, the beginning, the place where the project was going to be established. Uh, then the, the project was based in developing eight spaces on that abstract cubes. That is one of the parts that I developed with Ateneo de Fabricació de las Corts. And it was based on uh, experimenting with materials and then trying to give a character to each of the spaces. Then another problem was how does a four-dimensional space work? In a four-dimensional space, we have more space than in a three-dimensional one. So, space is compressed and all the, the plans of the cube are walkable. So you had to forget those distinction between floor, walls, or ceiling, because depending on uh, the direction from where you came, you could uh, come 
through this plane or this one or that one. So all the cubes were created thinking of the, uh, on this characteristic of the cube. So here are the eight spaces. This also allowed to experiment uh, with virtual reality because virtual reality was what allowed uh, this to be workable and experienced. Uh, and this was one of the main reasons of, uh, of the decision of using virtual reality because I didn't want it to be just a big render, but an experience, oh, sorry, an experience that made sense. World. We are used to see spaces in terms of floor, ceiling, and wall. If we expand this space name cube, we will obtain a bit dimensional model with eight sides. We can fly around the cube, but for a bit dimensional being, this would be interpreted as a circuit with a mysterious vanishment. In a 4D world, that we can only experience in the 3D projection, something equivalent happens. Let's see how it works. Okay. So, as you have seen, you could uh, think about going through mirrors, uh, putting the head inside a big uh, sphere, or walking through these cables. Or... Yes. So what I was saying is that I wanted it to have sense. Well, as the video is interrupting me constantly, we will watch the video, which is a resume of what I we told live you. We in a tridimensional world. We are used to see spaces in terms of floor, ceiling, and wall. If we expand this space name cube, we will obtain a bidimensional model with eight sides. We can fly around the cube, but for a bidimensional being, this would be interpreted as a circuit with a mysterious vanishment. In a 4D world that we can only experience in a 3D projection, something equivalent happens. Let's see how it works. We will take a look through a section on the unfolded hypercube. When we move around the hypercube, the walls of each of the eight cubes that conform it are cellings grounds and also walls of the other cubes. So a vanishment again seems to happen when we reduce one dimension on the representation, but in four-dimensional world, there is no trick. The only way to experience this architectural challenge is VR. Let's give it a try. So now you are going to see some of the some images of the experience of virtual reality and, and the exploration of that hypercube. There were two hands that you had uh, related with the controllers, so you could navigate through the the eight cubes and experience what it is this, for the space to fall down, as you have seen previously. Okay, so what we, I was going to say before the video started repeatedly to, uh, to repro reproduce is why uh, virtual reality here was important. It was not just a big render that represented a 3D model of uh, a building that w one could construct anywhere. Uh, this, uh, in, in that case, Four dimension cannot be built in a three-dimensional world. So the only way to inhabit and experience a four-dimensional world was through VR. We could not see the whole hypercube uh, as it is, just shadows, as I explained, but uh, you could have an experience of the inside of that, those cubes and the relationships that were explained in the video. So now I wanted to talk a little bit about other VR systems that uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you have tried. This is a Google Cardboard system. And 
For example, uh, we as an office implemented it in an exercise with uh, students of 8 to 10 years old uh, with more simpler programs of 3D modeling, like SketchUp. We uh, teach the students how to model in it, in it. Then we try to model spaces of the school and try to modify them with textures. And then finally, students could experience uh, this on a Google Cardboard headset. So uh, to sum up, uh, if when I was five, I had this relationship with the screen and that uh, kids have this powerful experience now, uh, I, one could ask what could they possibly achieve in the future years. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Lana and I'm an anthropologist, which means that I had absolutely no idea of what a makerspace was in February this year and just starting to learn about it now um, as part of my master project. So I came to Barcelona because I heard that there's a lot going on here and they're trying to set up a network with these spaces and everything. And by coincidence, I heard about La Fabrica del Sol, which is one of the Ateneus they have in Barcelona. And one evening, I saw that there was a, the, the door was open. I just walked in, and Alphonse, who's walking, uh, working there, he immediately gave me a tour and tried to show me all of the machines they had and how they were working. And I was impressed. So I asked him if I could talk to him another time because I didn't have much time at the moment. And we met up another time. I talked to him, and he explained me what these places do and what they are there for. And he said, maybe if you want to, you can come um, next week maybe and make something. I said, yeah, sure, why not? I never did it before. I would love to learn more about what I'm researching. I mean, I see other people do it, but I have no idea how to do it myself. So I was talking, I wanted to use the 3D printer because I thought that was the coolest one. <laughs> And uh, I was talking to my roommate and we decided to make something small for in the house that we just downloaded a, a design from the internet because I have no idea how to design myself either. And I went to the Ateneo again and Joel helped me <laughs> um, put the design in, into all the programs and explained to me how it worked and also let me experiment a lot myself, not just showing me but letting me click the right things and asking me questions that I had no idea what was the answer to, but it was a really interesting way of learning. And the next day I came to pick up my 3D printed thing uh, for at home. And I don't think you explained it, but uh, the Ateneus work according to contraprestation, which means that you have to give something in, your, in return for your use of the machines. So instead of paying for use of it, you give a service so, for example, if you know very well how to use a 3D printer, maybe you can, I don't know, give a workshop for other people that have no idea what it is about 3D printing, so they learn about that as well. Or if you know how to design very well, you can make a design that they can put up in the Ateneo for other people to see and that they can use for their own purposes. So, of course, I also needed to do a contraprestation. And I didn't really know what to offer because I just learned how to 3D print and that was it. And I was also not, I mean, it's just a small thing that I made, so I was not very good at it. So I asked if I could volunteer or maybe translate something. And then after a while, Alphonse came to me and said, maybe if you want to do something, uh, we have the signs in the building and I actually don't like them so much. It's just printed on paper with an ugly uh, typewriting and they're like laminated and plastic put on the wall. So maybe if you want to, we will show you how to use the laser cutter and then you can print some nice signs for us. So I came back this week <laughs> and again, again, Joel was there to help me, show me the programs, how to do it. And we actually designed something as well, very simple, but still, um, to print uh, the signs for the building. And after the first one, I basically could set the settings for the, print, the, the 3D cutter, uh, the la laser cutter myself and just print the rest. 
So I learned to use the laser cutter as well this week. And I don't know, maybe I'll come back to make something else as well for myself, or I don't know, maybe do something else. Um, but what I really like about the Ateneus in general, because as part of my research, I visited all three of them actually, is you just walk in and they start talking to you and you can do whatever you want to. They're super, super nice, super helpful as well. And just make you experiment a little bit with what there is and how you can use it. They try to teach you a little bit about what their ideas are and how they think that the world maybe should be or should not be. Or It's a very interesting thing and I love to have learned about it and I will definitely get more involved into it. Because even though I never thought that I would be able to do this as an anthropologist, it seemed like a very big step to actually design something and make something. I, I learned how to use a 3D printer, I 3D printed something, and I learned to use a laser cutter, and laser cut it something. It's really, really cool. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is uh, Mauricio, and I was born uh, in Peru. Um, during the 90s, uh, when I was growing up, we had a very, very big um, uh, cholera outbreak, and about 10,000 people died in a few weeks uh, just by drinking dirty water and uh, also like uh, contaminated food. And, you know, I, I grew up, uh, I studied abroad, uh, I was very lucky, and then uh, suddenly, um, one day I go back to Peru, I went to visit my friend in the rainforest and we're in the Amazon walking and suddenly we are like super thirsty, it was very, very hot uh, and I realized that uh, in the Amazon you couldn't drink the water in the streams. It was very, like very clear and, and very clean, but you couldn't drink the water straight from nature because um, uh, of mining, illegal mining, you know, they throw like mercury into the water, even in the rainforest. Uh, also uh, from uh, animals or people just pooing into the water, into the water streams. Uh, and then I realized like, um, you know, even in the most pristine places in the world, you cannot drink uh, water, no? So that, that really struck me. Um, I'm, I, I'm an, an economist. I didn't do any design or I didn't do any engineering. Uh, but before, I had been into the Maker Fair and I had been uh, reading about the Maker Movement, about the uh, collaborative economy, Maker Spaces, and so on. No? And um, so I decided to find out if you could do a water filter on your own. So how to clean water that is dirty, contaminated with, with bacteria, with uh, chemicals and how to, you could do it uh, at home. So I started with, um, with a PVC pipe and um, a water bottle. So I wanted to make a small water filter into like a, a plastic bottle because also plastic is very, you know, it's contaminating. Um, and uh, I came to Barcelona three years ago. I had this idea of making a small water filter into a bottle and in the open source circuit Circular Economy Days, uh, people talk about the Ateneo de Fabricación in La, La Fabrica del Sol. So I went there, I talked to Alphonse, and I, I wanted to make um, a 3D printed uh, prototype. So basically, uh, this is the first uh, prototype that we did, uh, which was like a case where you could uh, put something inside and then filter the water. And the idea was that um, you could make it very low cost, uh, open, collaborative, and uh, fit it into, into a bottle, no? and then drink the water straight from it. So that was the first uh, idea, the first prototype. Uh, after a few months, I applied to uh, an acceleration program in, in France. 
in a castle, uh, an abandoned castle where 100 hippies and designers and technologists uh, move, moved inside. And we lived there for four weeks. So we, co -live, we were co-working, co-living in a very, very unique place in France. Uh, again, I did more prototypes, you know, of, this would be for like a big bottle. Um, and then I had to research on what the media could, could be done because uh, actually 3D printing is very, not very good uh, for high speed, uh, large volumes and so on. So I wanted to make something for one euro. No? And, and, and there's millions of people in the world that don't have access to clean water, actually 800 million people. So um, after that, we prototype more with uh, 3D printing, with 3D design, with different people from this place, uh, a professor in Paris, uh, a friend of mine in Tenerife, uh, and so on. And at the end, we came up uh, with a final product uh, with support from a foundation in the, in the UK, uh, which actually... Um, So basically, you have like water that is very dirty. Um, it can have bacteria, it can have sediment, it can have um, lots of uh, bugs that could, make, could kill you in like three days, like cholera, for example. And what we do is... Um, What we did is a filter that is very small, very uh, low cost as well, and that it works immediately. You don't have to wait, you don't have to um, uh, put any chemicals, you don't need any energy. Uh, so in an emergency, actually this was thought for like a flood or earthquake, uh, or developing countries that um, don't have clean water, like in Africa or Latin America. Uh, so basically you can uh, get water from a stream, from a lake that is dirty, and uh, drink it straight from the bottle. So, sorry. If you have a yeah, glass. Yeah. Anyway, we can maybe we can filter it into a bottle and then drink it because it's. Take this one. Can you get this one? So we can try this one. And you can drink it straight from the bottle. So. Yeah, I've drank a lot of liters, so it's fine. Um, and then also we did the, um, the testing collaboratively. So uh, because it's about health, uh, we did the testing in the uh, University of Barcelona in Switzerland. There's testing being done in uh, the University of uh, Berlin also. And uh, now we developed like a very, very low cost, like a three euro incubator um, that you can do testing with uh, dry plates in different countries. So I went to Peru and I took water from the river uh, and there's like about 10, 10 million bacteria per 100 milliliters uh, and it filters all of them. Uh, so it's very safe to drink. Um, and yeah, so, so that was basically the, the project. Um, now we're, uh, we're going to test it with large NGOs uh, during emergency settings. And, um, and actually, we're trying to also uh, market this for people who go outdoors. So if you go to the mountains or if you travel to, you know, like India, etc. So for people who travel, they can pay one and pay, let's say, 19 euros. And for that, uh, you can give one also to a family in need. No? 
but the long-term vision of uh, this is to make it for one euro uh, for emergencies. So, so this idea started, um, you know, like just an, as, an, as, an, as an idea, and it came up to be a final product. Uh, and it was all thanks to, uh, you know, the first uh, prototypes, the first ideas to make them real and show them to people. You know, people then joined the project. They were really excited and, and so on. So it was very, very useful to have something as an object, no? to, to make people uh, think about the potential and also join the, the, this initiative. No? Um, yeah, so that's, that's basically my experience at the Fab Labs. And uh, it was very, very useful. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Herman. Um, here. Good. How are you? Good. OK. Um, I, I work in this prototype of a lamp that, OK, I don't have any, any place to put it. Maybe. Uh, may I use? Yes. Okay, I light, I light my mate. So, um, this is a prototype of a lamp. Uh, I'm working, uh, I started last year. Um, it's uh, based in Arduino, um, and it has a NeoPixel technology that it allows you to, to, put, uh, to put in all the pixels of this, of this LED bar you can put uh, any value in each RGB and W LED. Um, for, for mixing colors, usually uh, from the Sony televisions, uh, you must to put red, green, and blue, and you can uh, mix every color you need. For example, if you put red and green, you get um, yellow. But the problem in illumination is um, you need a white light to, to have a, a high degree. The degree is the chromatic resolution index, um, and, and the light the, of the sun, for example, it has a degree of uh, 100%. So if you put a red, green, and light, uh, louder, I better. OK, hi, Fira. <laughs> um, so, uh, in, in lighting, in homes, you need to, to have a high degree light, but for effects, you need to mix another light, the red or the green or the blue. So, um, this technology has in each chip of LED four chips inside, RGB and W to have the high degree. Here you have a, a, we have an encoder, if you can see there. The encoder is uh, the interaction uh, between the, the motion you do and the digital system that is programmed on, on C, the, the famous language of, pro, of pro, programming language. Um, here, uh, there are LEDs with the same technology that it changed with functions. It changed the color, and you can set and put everything you need. Um, in, in lighting nowadays, uh, we need to have a driver to, to control the devices. For example, uh, you can go to a, a, a place to, to buy a lamp, and you will see hundreds of models, but uh, these models uh, don't have a driver, a control system. The control system will allow, allow us to save energy 
and to, and to get uh, interactive spaces. So, uh, with this project, I'm working in the Ateneu de Fabricación Ciudad Meridiana. Oh, okay, now, now my car. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm, I'm working in a home automation system that is decentralized. Um, a difference of the system uh, we have uh, today that you, you need a hub of special, uh, special routers to, to connect the, the devices. Uh, you, can, you will be able to see how, if I go for 30 seconds or one minute, it will turn off. But um, this has a, a present sensor and, and it gives you interactive uh, space if, spaces with this, um, with this processor. There are some kinds of of function you can you can have with a processor in, in a lamp. So the the concept of this is um, that all the lamps know what they should have a control to save energy and to get uh, spaces interactive and the technology must be open uh, so, for example, with an Arduino, Arduino devices that you can connect and interact with an, any digital uh, system. So, uh, thank you. And this is my project. <laughs>